Hey there! I'm having a little bit of a lazy start to the evening. As you can see, I'm sitting in a comfortable patio chair here. Uh, but I'm about to change all that. I'm about to get started because I've got something really cool um, that I'm about to do. We have historically and, and still do, we buy meat in bulk a lot of times. We'll buy from local farmers uh, a side of beef or um, a whole hog or chickens or whatever, whatever meat. Uh, we typically buy in bulk and we'll put it in the freezer and um, use it over time. And we can control the quality of the meat uh, really well that way and um, make it a little bit more affordable and healthier and so forth. So that's a common practice. Today, an interesting thing, I have three steaks left from a prior cow uh, that we had purchased and one of them is a filet. Uh, I, have, I have one filet, one New York strip, and one uh, top sirloin. And so I'm going to do an interesting compare and contrast. We're going to take those three steaks from the beef that we had uh, purchased a year ago and I have uh, a new beef from the, the same uh, individual, actually my brother, and um, but it's a different cow. So the one before was an Angus and a Holstein mix, 50-50. This cow is 100% Angus. Um, they were managed in much the same way and so it'll be an interesting side-by-side -side comparison on taste and quality and and uh, you know how good they are. So for this test, because uh, we're really trying to let the beef flavor come out and test uh, very specifically the actual taste differences, uh, taste differences between the two, we're going to keep the seasonings incredibly simple. Salt and pepper, that's all I'm going to use. I'm just going to put salt, coarse salt, uh, and coarse pepper on the steaks, season them in that way. Otherwise, I'm going to leave them just the raw beef, and we'll get to see uh, the flavors really come out in that way. So it'll be a really neat test. I'm looking forward to doing it. I'm going to have to get myself, my lazy self, off of this chair and uh, go inside and, and start getting this uh, prepped and ready to go get the grill fired up and, uh, and work on getting this ready to go. It'll be a, a great compare. I'm looking forward to it. I'm going to bring you along for the ride, so join me. Let's go inside, get this squared away, um, and uh, see what the differences are. It'll be a great taste test for me. You only get to hear about it. Sorry, you don't get to taste it. You'll have to do your own taste test comparison. Let me know how that goes. I'm inside, I got myself off of that nice comfortable chair and I got the steaks all seasoned up. Um, so it's just a simple salt and pepper, like I said. So I didn't uh, bother to show you guys that. That's a pretty straightforward process, but they're ready to go. We're gonna take them outside and, um, and get them cooked up from here. My brother, the one that uh, I actually buy the beef from and his wife are coming over for supper. Um, so we're going to try them out together. So he's going to be here. We're going to be out at the grill working on getting everything uh, cooked up. And uh, I'll take you along for the ride, let you listen in on some of the chatter as we, as we cook these up. And then when they're all ready, we're going to bring them inside and see if we can just detect any difference between the two. I think it's going to be difficult because I know uh, I've had some from both and they were both very good. I've just not done them side by side like this. So we're gonna we're gonna do that now and um, see see what we think. Okay, so we've got all the steak here, and uh, these are the old ones. That's a sirloin, a New York strip, and a fillet. And I was I misspoke earlier. These were not part Angus, part Holstein. These are all Holstein, 100% Holstein. And then we've got Angus over here. These are the new ones. So these are fillets. That's a sirloin, and then there's two New York strips here. So we're going to cook these up and uh, see where it goes from here. I think we're going to do these big ones first because they're going to take longer. I'm going to leave those off because I think what we're going to have is these are going to cook slower, these are going to cook super fast, and these are going to be somewhere in the middle. How do you like your steaks? Medium? Yeah. Medium. <clears throat> maybe. Yeah. Usually medium, maybe a little light. By light you mean more on the rare side of medium or more on the done side? A little bit more rare. Okay, so probably 135 to 140 yeah, degrees-ish. I usually kind of run this a little bit by the clock just because 
you don't want to burn it. And I've found at 550 degrees, you get about a minute to a minute and a quarter before you're running the risk of burning it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You can also tell by when it starts to separate, like that's still pretty stuck. Yeah, when it's, when it's actually popping off. Yeah. When it's still stuck, you probably leave it. When it's starting to separate, it's time to pull. It's my first time to use this too. Okay. Yeah. So we'll we'll try it. Yeah, that looks pretty good. So what I like to do here on these big ones, I'll cook not just top and bottom, but I'll do the sides as well mm -hmm. because it really nice sear all the way around. Yeah, otherwise you get you don't get as much of that char everywhere that you want. On the smaller ones like these, obviously not. You're just cooking both sides. But on the on these big fat, these are like two inch fillets. That's about it's an square. inch and a half. It's almost square on a fillet, yeah. And so you want to really cook. You got six sides. Yeah. Right. By the time you're done, even on the New Yorks, when I've had the really thick ones, not the fat side, um, but the the other side that's not fat, I'll do the same thing. I gotta watch that fire. It's gonna take off if I don't close that. I've used tongs on the steaks, and that works fine, but you can't get under it very well. Pop it. You have to like grab it from the side almost, yeah. or get a little bit under the edge and then flip it. But you have less control over that, what you're doing. I kind of like that. Looks pretty good. Yeah, yeah I kind of like that so far. It's the inaugural time here, but so far, so far so good. Right, because you can you can kind of grab it, which is what I've done like that before, but you can really get underneath it and control what you're doing a little bit better, I think. These will cook in a hurry. Yeah, I usually just you know, Oh my like a, a few minutes. Like a I usually just flash them on both sides, basically just give a good char mark. Yeah. And then I put them off to the side and let them cook for a little bit. And then I'm done. But not much because yeah, I mean a few minutes. Yeah. But you're probably less than ten minutes top to bottom on those. Oh yeah. Yeah, it doesn't take very much. Yeah, it's see that's nice. that's starting to look pretty good. Almost a little too much on that one. It'll be alright. Those are almost done and then I think based on size we take the other fillets, move them over, and put this sirloin on. This one and these two will cook faster. Yeah. And we'll let those finish on the sidelines while we're searing the others. Those, yeah. yeah, sometimes, um, Micah, I talked to Micah, sometimes people will, he does this, they'll take and cook them on indirect first and sear them at the end. Yeah, I've not it's, ever done that, but it's, I've done it's it. a pretty good option. It's a good option, but you've got to really be careful because what'll happen if you're not really on top of it, one of two things will happen. Either you won't get it cooked enough on the indirect side of the fire, and then when you go to sear it, you sear it and it's not done yet. That's the better of the two problems. The other problem that's a lot worse is you let it go too long on the indirect. It's already really cooked up. Yeah, and then in order to get a good sear, you're well done. Yeah, you're overdoing it. On the steak, and that's... That's the worst. So we're going to put this big one on. I think it's going to take a little bit. These won't take as long. They're not as thick, but a little bit. That's our next victim. And um, yeah, I think that'll work. Yeah, if um, the way that, that Micah has done it is that, but he's, you know, you're probing it a lot, which is the, I don't, I don't like to probe too much. Like you can probe too much, and if you do, then you end up kind of not in a good spot. You're letting all the juices just run out every time you probe it. But you'd also don't want it. Like if you're going to do that, 
you probably want to move it from indirect to, to direct at like, I don't know, somewhere between 100 and 110 internal temp if you're trying to finish out at like 135. Yeah. And if you gauge that wrong, then you're, Done. yeah. Done. I mean, if, you, if you're wrong the, the one way, you can always come back in. Yeah, those look good. You can always come back in and move it back over here, right? If, if you took it off too soon and seared it, and then it's like, oh, it's only 120. Right. Well, you just move it over here and it's not a big deal. Yeah. But if you go the other way, it is a royal pain. It's the safer bet if, you know, in terms of getting it cooked <laughs> where you like it. <laughs> yeah. The other thing that um, I haven't done but I'm interested to do sometime is sous vide, which is the idea where you take, um, take it. Typically, they, they sell cookers that are designed for that, but it's the concept of putting the meat in a bag, essentially, and putting the bag in hot water and cooking it that way. Like not just hot water in a sink, but actually like heated water. And then, um, yeah, that's looking good. And then from there, you take it and um, once it's again, it's the whole, it's the same idea as mostly cooking it and then searing it versus searing it first and then mostly, it's the same concept, but you take it and you cook it in the water to get it up to whatever temp you want, 110 or 115 or whatever you think is right. And then you take it out of there and you sear it on the grill. And the, the idea is you're gonna get a more perfectly even temperature throughout all of the meat yeah. versus cooking from the outside in. And the inside is 135 maybe or 140, but the outside's 160. The idea is it's just the crust that you formed and the rest of the whole steak is is more the same temperature. That's the idea. Yeah. Um, haven't. I haven't personally tried it. I would like to, but I don't have the equipment to do it. Oh. Um, yeah, you got to have something to um, to cook it in the bag in the water. You have to have a, a cooker of some kind that does that. Um, so I'd like to try it at but some you point. Do it all on the grill. No, you you do it in that other cooker with the water until it gets to whatever temperature. And then you just throw it on. And, and then you throw it on. Now the good news with that is the way you can be sure of it, you don't have to probe it. You set the water temperature to 110 and cook it for however long, the meat's gonna be 110. Yeah, eventually. Right, I mean, it, right. eventually, it, it's it, not gonna get 130 in 110 degree water. Right. And it's also not gonna, oh, you know, get underdone either. All right, let's move these over. I think we're getting close to wanting to put those on. Let's just see where we're at real quick. Yeah, yeah, 125 on that one. And 110 there. Let's check one of these that just came off. Yeah, 115. So we're, we're in similar spots across the board. I think we want to drop these on as well. Let them start to cook a little bit. But we're trying to get them all done at about the same time. And that's not always easy to do when you have this many different cuts of meat. And that many different sizes. And that many different sizes. Not just big around, but thickness. Right. So that's hard. If you have more uniform cuts, it's a lot easier to time them all. Little, little more challenging for sure, what we're doing. But this is fun, we get to taste, taste test them all. Yeah. yeah, that's looking pretty good. Yeah, I like those, um, those compares, that's, that's a fun thing to do. Yeah. And in this case, it's, there's a lot of variables. There's the different types of beef, right? You've got the Holstein versus the Angus. Now, what was yours? It was a cross between Angus and Holstein. Okay, so we actually have all three. We have, yeah, we have all three options. So the old, my old beef is Holstein. all 100% Holstein, which is this sirloin right here, yep. that filet, and that New York strip. So that's 100% Holstein, those three cuts. Yep. All right. And then my new beef 
which is this sirloin and those two fillets is 100% Angus. Yeah. And the one you brought from your beef is 50-50, Holstein yeah. and Angus, which are the two New York strips here. Right. That's a fun compare. And then the other variables that obviously we have no idea or control over is what the butcher did. That may have been different. That may have been different. Did they hang it for longer, shorter, different environment, whatever? Possibly. How did they process it? What was the the butcher process itself? Did the cow get into stress during the butcher process? More or less? Yeah, you're standing right in the line of smoke. Yeah. That, so that, those, those are, are variables. That are definite variables. Yeah. Those are certainly variables that we have no control over. But either way, it'll be fun to test them. Filled up the grill, that's for sure. Oh, yeah. I didn't totally run out of real estate, but we're we're close. Let me just check this guy. Yeah, awfully close. I think we need to get some platters before long and Whew, the smoke is blowing all the wrong direction tonight. Whew, that's sometimes how it is. It blows the wrong direction. Let's check this. Yeah, that's perfect. We still got a little ways to go, I think, on it. Um, let's move that out. Doesn't cook very well with the lid off on those indirect. Because right. you're not creating the oven right. type environment. Where are you running? The, what's the temperature running on the grill? On the grill? Well, it's all the way open, which usually means, I mean, I don't have a good read because the meat is kind of blocking what would hit the dome, right? So the dome temperature right now is 375. But there's meat in between the fire and the dome. And at the grate level, it tends to run about 100 degrees hotter than the, the dome. When it's right over the right over the right, right fire, the yeah. So my guess is that we're close to 600 where this meat is, yeah. And this is more like 400 where we're not on the fire but just in the in the oven. Push the push the units over a little bit to that other side, or are they in the center? No, I pushed them over. Yeah, so once I got them lit, the the performer has the um, propane light, right, which I used. And so, but once I got them lit, I moved them over um, because I usually do it that way. I've, I've, that smoke is all going the wrong way. I usually move them to the back because then you're not reaching over fire yep. to work with me. I've burned the hair off my arm a few times doing that. So most of the time I scoot the fire to the back and make the front the indirect side of things. Now the other thing that um, works pretty well if you're doing a lot, like if you're doing chicken wings, for example, like I did the other day. If you're doing something like that, then what I have done is left the fire right in the center and you have the entire outer ring as indirect. So you have a lot of real estate for something like chicken. But see, this is so big, if you put the fire in the middle, there would be nowhere, nowhere that, you could, get it that you could put that to get it off the heat. It Somewhere, it would be sitting on the heat, everywhere. So, I don't much care for that. So that's the other reason to push the fire all the way to one side or the other. Yeah, this one, this one's ready to come off. It's, it's done. That's a huge chunk of meat. 
I think these are about ready to pull over. That one could go a little more, not a lot. Yeah, those are done. Those are getting close. 132. 118. 120. And 110. So those still need to go a little bit. That one is, um, yeah, 125. So all of these are in about the same spot. I think if we just line them up around the fire a little closer. And close the lid, we'll be ready in just a few minutes. I'm excited to try this. This will be a neat test. Yeah. Those were the last ones to go on and they're already done. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because she had them cut thinner. Right, so they right. Definitely are faster. Uh-huh. Those are thinner, I think, than the sirloin that we got from the new one. Yeah. Did you just take the, the, the default of whatever the butcher's default was on thickness? Know. We'll have to ask no, her. she probably told him. She probably told him, and I don't know what it was. Well, you go thinner, you get more, more, more steaks, color. more yeah. quantity. So in, in theory, it's like, it's not actually more quantity of meat, but, right. you know, more... More, steaks yeah same amount of, of weight but just cut, cut into more chunk more yeah. pieces yeah mm -hmm. one of these i think it's this one got just a little bit more crusty than i would like yeah it's that one that's okay chance to try all the, all the <laughs> options yeah we can we can try rare all the way to well done tonight <clears throat> no, it's not well done, but it might be um, medium well. And even and the inside may not be too bad, but I think I think it got a little overdone inside too. Yeah, that's going up. 131, 132, 142. That one's done. I'm gonna burn my fingers. That one's still slow rolling. That one's done. Mm. Maybe not quite. So we have I should put old and new, which means that's a new one, and these two are new ones. And that's an old one. These have got to be awfully close. Yeah, very. All right, the New York strip is ready. The filet is probably about ready. Yeah, those are 140, 140, 142. And this one is 140, 141. So we're hovering right around 140 on all of those. I think we should take them off. And um, all right, so this is my old platter. And this is the new platter. We're gonna kill our fire.
Okay, so we've got them done. This is the, the new beef. We've got two fillets, a sirloin, and two New York strips there. And then this is the old one, which has one New York strip, one fillet, and one giant sirloin um, on the bottom. So we're gonna take these inside and taste test them and see what we think. All right, so here is the old beef. There's sirloin. This is the New York strip, and there's the filet. It's a nice uh, medium. And this is the new, we've got sirloin there, New York strip, and filet. So we're gonna taste test these and find out. Well, man oh man, that was delicious. The um, Good grief, they, they were cooked great. Um, it was a little bit challenging because we had several different types of cuts and they were all different shapes and sizes and thicknesses. Um, everything from the thickest being a two inch all the way to a half an inch. So pretty, pretty big variance between all the steaks. So it took a little bit of uh, manipulating to try to get them to all get cooked the way you want, right? Which we were targeting about a medium, uh, maybe the low 135 to 140 internal temperature. So really right at a true medium is what we were targeting. And, um, you know, that was, I think we got there on, on most of them. They were, they were pretty good, but it was hard because we wanted them to all kind of finish at about the same time so that we weren't, you know, having cold steak sitting out for a while while we finished others. So it was a little bit of a, of a challenge to, you know, figure out when to start everything and, and, um, and, and that kind of thing. So, but anyway, it worked out pretty well. We got them done. Um, and honestly, out of all the steaks that we did, um, only a couple of them, the really thin half inch New York strips got overdone. Those were more of a medium well um, when they were completed. Everything else was really spot on with, with a true medium. And Wow, it was fun. We had so we had other we had potatoes and um, macaroni and cheese and some vegetables, some broccoli and, and carrots cooked up, and so it was just a delicious meal all around. But as far as the steak goes, we had to um, we had a really difficult time even detecting the difference between the two. Honestly, they were very much the same. They were cooked the same. They were raised by the same individual, and um, really the only difference was the the breed. And the butcher process because they were they were processed by two different butchers so there's some variability there that we couldn't uh, control but um otherwise we had a, a mix of a 100 percent angus 100 percent holstein and a 50 50 angus holstein blend represented on this on the steaks and um you know there wasn't much noticeable difference honestly from a, a taste perspective from a tenderness perspective just very, very much the same. I, I might give the edge slightly um, to the Angus on the sirloin from a, just being maybe a little bit more tender um, than, than the other ones were, but that was not true. I, I couldn't detect that from you know the New York strips or the, the fillets as much. So really almost no, no difference, uh, to be honest. It was, they were both amazing. We had, we had more steak than we could eat uh, but that's okay. We'll slice them up and use them use them later. But it was really a fun uh, thing to try, and I encourage you to try stuff like that because I think it's it's really cool to try um, different ways of doing things, and certainly to try and and some compare and contrast uh, with different foods and and different food types. Um, so we'll we'll do more of these kind of things uh, in the future. But it was fun. It was great. We had a good time. Um, the steak was really phenomenal. It was just delicious all the way around. And uh, I, I thought we might detect some differences, um, but I wasn't sure. I knew they were both good, but uh, honestly, it, it, we couldn't hardly tell the difference. If it was a blind test, I don't think we would have been able to tell the difference. Like I said, I would give the edge just a little bit on the sirloins to the, the Angus over the Holstein, but that's it. Like, honestly, if it was a blind test, I don't even know that I would have uh, been able to tell you the difference. So then we'll stop here. It was a great night. We had a, a wonderful time. Uh, it was good weather, good food, good friends and family uh, to visit with. So we had a good time 
And uh, we'll do this again uh, in a few days with something else. We'll try a, a new food or something and um, take you along for that journey as well. You just thought that was the end. Well, I thought it was the end too, but no, I thought of something else I wanted to share real quick. A lot of times people put a lot of stock into the breed. You know, they'll advertise that it's 100% Angus or uh, it's a Hereford. That was a big one um, before Angus kind of took over things. But based on what we did tonight, I would say my opinion is that the breed matters a lot less than how the animal is raised and what they're, what they're fed on. I've had a lot of uh, different uh, steers through the years, some that were grass fed 100% start to finish, some that were grain fed, some that were grass fed but finished on grain, and a variety of other things. And, and there's been a lot of variability in the taste and uh, the texture, the tenderness of the, of the meat, uh, depending on what we got. And, and I know when you buy from stores, Walmart versus uh, Costco versus Sam's Club versus Fresh Time or whoever, wherever you buy from, there's variability there as well. And so, um, you know, I, I know a lot of people put a lot of stock in the different breeds they'll advertise. Um, oh, we're a hundred percent Angus beef or we're Hereford beef or, or whatever. And there may be some differences to that. I'm not saying there's none, but based on what we did tonight, I think, um, it's, it's, it's minor. I think the bigger impact and, and what makes the biggest difference is not so much the breed and a lot more has to do with the way in which the animal was raised and what they fed on. So I'll add that little tidbit. Hopefully it helps you and uh, we'll stop it from here.